Good morning to everyone. It is good to see you here, and I am thankful for the opportunity that we have to be together to be able to worship once more. You know, we kind of have a habit when we come together on Sunday mornings, whoever gets up here to do the announcements or to address the congregation as far as leading and singing or whatever it may be, we, we kind of start off with good morning. And I was talking to my son uh, yesterday and he told me something that my granddaughter did last week. She's four years old. And if you remember last week after our services, Brother Mark Taylor was installed as, as an elder. And so Brother Harold, I believe, was the first to get up and begin talking. And when he got up after the service and he addressed everyone, he said to everyone, good morning. And Jordan, my four-year-old granddaughter, said, oh no, are we starting all over? <laughs> well, I guess it feels that way sometimes to a four-year-old. Maybe to a 40-year-old too, I, I don't know. I want to talk today about the idea of overcoming evil with good. I hope that we all understand that that's what our Lord would have us to do, to overcome evil with good. I want you to think about some things that we can read of that are going on. You think about reading of political leaders who will do anything to keep their power and their position. They're not concerned about how they rule or, or the people that they are over, just about keeping their position. And they'll stop at nothing. We can read of legal enforcement agents who are putting innocents to death, even while some of them are worshiping. We can read of our political leaders and our educators practicing same-sex marriage. And it's so accepted that it's in every sector, it seems. We can read of infanticide being so practiced that it's commonplace. And whoever conceives a child can decide if they want that child to live or not. We can read of race tensions that are at the breaking point where people look at others and if they're not like themselves, they have contempt for them. I read these things to Tammy yesterday. She said, Tim, you can't start out with that. You'll get people upset. And then I said, Tammy, all those things that I shared with you aren't from today. They're from the Bible. And from, they're from the history of the first century. Political leaders that will do anything to keep their position. Think about Herod making sure that he was going to kill the king of the Jews. Homosexuality. Do you remember that Nero married a man? The great philosophers of that time period. Many of them practiced homosexuality openly. Law enforcement agents killing people who are worshiping. Pilate sent his soldiers and mingled the blood of the Galileans, 18 of them, with their sacrifices. People didn't want a child. Just took it out, left it, exposed it. You talk about human trafficking... There were 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire of the first century. I bring these things to our attention just to point out the fact that man has been dealing with evil for a long, long time. But the way that God wants us to overcome evil has remained the same. We are to overcome evil with good. This world's been evil for a long time. You know, in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 4, we're reminded who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. Jesus gave himself for you and for me to deliver us. 
from this evil world. We know that as Christians, we are to be in the world, but we're not to be of the world. And so we are to live differently. And I realize that at times in our thinking, it may not feel like we're accomplishing much when we try to overcome evil with good. Our world has the idea that you fight fire with fire. You just give evil right back. And maybe that will stop it all. But what we really see is that that doesn't help. What I want us to do this morning is to notice a couple of these ideas and then share a few thoughts that we need to keep in mind as we try to overcome evil with good. Let's begin by noticing that fighting evil with evil just brings more evil. That's what it does. And you can see that from examples in the, in the scriptures. Jesus understood this. In John chapter 18, we read about Jesus being taken from the garden. Judas had led that mob, and they were going to take Jesus and put him on trial. And of course, it would lead ultimately to his crucifixion. Earlier, he had told his apostles to get a sword or two, and they said, we've got a couple, and he said, that's enough. And evidently, Peter had one of those. And so when this mob comes and seizes Jesus, we read about this. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then Jesus said unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? In Matthew's account, he explained to Peter that all that take up the sword will perish by the sword. I'm sure that was hard for Peter to understand at that time. It might have been one of those things that contributed to Peter denying him the three times that he did shortly thereafter. Jesus understood this isn't what we need to be doing. You look in Luke chapter 9, and you read about a situation where Jesus understands that he is on his way to Jerusalem. The Bible tells us that his face was set toward Jerusalem. And so his disciples, as they are traveling, go to a Samaritan village. And because, evidently, Jesus was not going to stay there very long, they reject them, not going to let them stay there. And James and John, those sons of thunder, they say to Jesus, would you like for us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them like, like Elijah did? You can read about that in the Old Testament. Jesus responds in Luke 9, verse 55, by rebuking them and saying, You know not of what manner of spirit you're of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Jesus didn't come to destroy, but to save. He understood that to try to get rid of evil by practicing that which is evil, doesn't get rid of the evil. It makes it worse. It turns you into what you were fighting against. Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. is quoted as saying this about this idea. The ultimate weakness of violence is that it is a descending spiral begetting the very thing it seeks to destroy. Instead of diminishing evil, it multiplies it. Through violence, you may murder the hater, but you do not murder hate. In fact, violence merely increases hate. Returning violence for violence multiplies violence, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. 
Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Folks, where do you suppose he got an idea like that? It's from the scriptures. It's from our Lord as he teaches us to overcome evil with good. When we, when we return evil for evil, it will cause us to be overcome with evil ourselves. I know that's a hard thing for us to, to deal with at times. Because our world teaches us that you have a right. You have a right to retaliate. What's the excuse that every person who gets in a fight gives for why they were fighting? He hit me first. She pushed me first. They said it first. And that gives us the right. That's the way we feel. And that's hard to overcome. I, I don't care who you are. That, that's hard to overcome. And yet that's what we must strive to do. Because if we return evil for evil, we're just going to be overcome by it ourselves. We are to overcome evil with good. Brother Paul read for us just a moment ago, there in Romans chapter 12, verses 19 through 21, where the Apostle Paul writes these things. And really, they're not new ideas. They're quotations from the Old Testament. Verse 19 is taken from Deuteronomy 32 and verse 35. Verse 20 is taken from Proverbs 25, verses 21 and 22. And so he would say on this occasion, he writes for us, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink, for in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. That's the idea. That's what we are to practice. Here is how we can have an influence for good upon our world. Here's how we deal with the evil that we face. We seek to overcome it with good. Aren't you glad that Jesus has shown us how to do that? He is the perfect example of living that godly life. And when it comes to this idea, Jesus shows us how. I know that there have been a lot of people who have gone through a lot of difficult things but I can't think of anyone who had to deal with more than our Lord. And yet he shows us how to overcome evil that was cast his way. One thing that we read about him is found in Acts chapter 10 and verse 38. Peter is preaching to Cornelius and his household. And as he speaks to them of Jesus Christ, he tells them that he was a man who went about doing good. That's what Jesus did. And I realize that much of that had to do with the miracles that he performed, the good, the kindness that he showed unto all that were brought unto him. We don't have that ability today. But the abilities that we have, we need to use to go about everywhere doing good. That needs to be our goal. No matter what others do to us, no matter what evil we face, what, no matter what wrongs we have to go through and endure, we are going to do good. That's what we're in control of, what we do. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verses 21 to 24, 
you have Peter writing these words about our Lord. For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Now watch it, verse 23. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live under righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. We focus on verse 24 quite often, and rightly so, because it speaks to us of the price that Jesus paid so that we could have life. But look at verse 23 again. Remember, Peter is talking about Jesus as our example, that we would follow after him, do as he has done. He was reviled. People spoke evil of him. They insulted him. Just think for a moment about what was said to our Lord while he was upon the cross, dying for the very people who were insulting him. And yet he doesn't revile again. You think about how he responded to those very men who crucified him. Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Do you suppose those soldiers had ever heard something like that? I imagine they had been called every name in the book. Every curse in the world had been hurled upon them for what they did to those people who were crucified. And here's a man who says, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Folks, Jesus shows us how to deal with others, and how to overcome evil. Oh, the world might look at that and say, that, you can't be like that. That's, you're so lame. That's so weak. You can't do that. You've got to stand up. You have a right. Jesus overcame with good. And I realize that a lot of times it may feel like we're not winning. We're not seeing the victory. We're not seeing the overcoming. But this is the way Christ would have us to live. And his way is the way of victory. And so as you think about that, overcoming evil with good, let's think about some things that can help us to do that. Thoughts to help us overcome evil with good. And I, I certainly don't claim to have all the wisdom in the world to know exactly how to do this. I, I struggle with this at times. There are times when I feel like, hey, I, I need to strike back. But I realize, and I hope that we all realize, that God would have us respond in a different way and to overcome evil with good. Four things I want to share with you real quickly. Number one, let's understand that every soul is important to God. If we'll look at our fellow man that way, it'll go a long way in helping us to overcome evil. When we understand the value of every person, remember what Jesus would say about a soul? Everything in this world couldn't even purchase one soul. Every person has a soul. And so we're going to treat other people the way God would have us to treat them. Because they're made in God's image. I, I realize that a lot of times folks don't act that way. Maybe sometimes we don't act that way. And a lot of times they don't deserve, perhaps, the kindness or goodness that we would extend unto them. You do it anyway. Because that's how you overcome evil. Understanding the importance of every person. No one is beneath us. 
And so we're going to treat others the way God wants us to treat them. Understanding every person is important to God. Number two, leave the matter of vengeance to God. Remember what he says there in Romans 12 and verse 19. He says, it belongs to me. I will repay. It's interesting when you look there in Romans chapter 12. The very next section of scripture, right after these verses, explains one of the ways that God executes his vengeance. And that's through government. That's through the punishment of those who break laws. It's not up to the individual to seek retaliation. I hear a lot of people say, we ought to still have that eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Folks, that wasn't individual retaliation. That was their government system. That was their legal system at that time. And the reason God gave it to them that way is to keep them from going further in their retaliation. You know how we are. You knock out my tooth, I want to knock out all your teeth. That, that's the way we work. And so God said, no, it, it's eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But again, it was the legal system, not individual retaliation. Today we're under a better covenant. And God has ordained civil government to punish those who do evil. And I know that sometimes government fails. I wonder why that is. Because it's made up of people. And we as people fail. That, that, that's why. It's not perfect. We've got a wonderful system. Does it make mistakes? Yes, it does. Do those who are guilty get away with their crimes from time to time? Yeah, they do. Do they receive as stern a punishment as they should? Often not. But God has said that this is one way. Now there's another way. God, through his providence, can certainly bring hardship upon those who practice evil. But folks, even if someone escapes judgment here upon this earth for the evil that they do, do you know what's waiting for them? Of course you do. If they enter into eternity unprepared, you know what's waiting. Pity them. Don't envy them. They didn't get away with anything. It's not up to us to seek vengeance. Oh, but I have a right that's what the world says. That's not what the scriptures say. Let's leave it in the hands of God. Because he'll do what's right. The third thought to keep in mind as we think about overcoming evil with good is this. Every person is a Christian or a potential, potent, potential Christian. You realize that? Everyone you come in contact with that is of age, is either a Christian, a brother or sister in Christ, or you need to look at them, we need to look at them, as potential Christians. And that means I'm going to conduct myself in such a way that I leave that door open for me to have an opportunity to share the gospel with that individual. I don't want that door to be shut because of the way that I chose to conduct myself. This past week, Tammy had to go to the doctors for a test. She got in there and she had to wait for a while. Imagine that. Go to a doctor's office and you have to wait. But, but she was waiting there and, and there was a lady that came in and she was a little hard of hearing. And so she didn't hear what the receptionist had to say, at least not fully. The receptionist handed her a piece of paper and said, you know, Go, go have a seat and you'll be called when it's your turn. She didn't hear all that. And so what she got was, this woman was rude to me. She didn't say anything to me. She just handed me a piece of paper. And she started talking out loud. 
And she started saying things like, I can't wait till they give me that survey of how I was treated here. I am really going to be hard on this person and all this stuff. And I was a receptionist and we never treated people this way. And all that. Her husband came in and he went up to the receptionist and explained that she was hard of hearing and, and wondered, you know, what was going on. And so he got the deal. She was okay. She went over and picked up a book magazine on prayer and she said out loud this is what our world needs it needs prayer it needs God that's what it needs and you suppose that receptionist would be willing to listen to her whatever she had to say after she'd said all those other things you see folks the way that we treat people matters and it doesn't matter if someone is mistreating us. We still want to practice that which is good. So that we leave those doors open. Those opportunities to share the gospel. Because that person is a potential Christian. And I hope that we look at our world that way. And we act accordingly. Toward your waitress, waiter, toward the person at the checkout line, <laughs> toward the doctor, the reception, whoever it is, toward the people on the road. I know some people sometimes give us those special salutes out there when we're driving. Does that mean we need to give one back? Lay on our horn and Let's overcome evil with good. Overcome them with good. Tammy, I got tickled this, well, it was last year actually, but it happened again this week. She, she taught students last year that were emotionally disturbed. One thing she learned about Columbus City Schools is the school system does nothing about students' language. They can call a teacher anything they want, and they do not get in trouble. Don't even bring them to the principal, because it doesn't matter. She had a little girl that called her a terrible name, and Tammy just said, oh, I love you too. And the little girl said, what? She said, Tammy said, yeah, I, I, I learned where that word that you said, that means I love you, so I'm just, I love you too. She said, that isn't what it means. Tammy said, in this classroom it does. And so every time she, she would just say, I love you too. That was last year. You realize this year, just this week, that little girl started texting Tammy again and asked if she could call and talk to Mrs. Hatfield. Now, I don't know where that will go. She's only a third grader or fourth grader or something like that. The folks, you overcome evil with good. And we want to keep planting a seed that hopefully will grow in the hearts of people to lead them to Christ. Every person we come in contact with is either a Christian, brother or sister in Christ, or we see them as a potential Christian. And then here's this last one. We make a difference one person at a time. We can look at our situation, our world, and we might think, and it's easy to think this way, I can't make any difference. What difference are my efforts going to make in this world where we see so much evil and wickedness? Just one person. But folks, remember, we're not just one. We're the church here at Alkire Road. Think of the impact in our community that we together can have when we together seek to overcome evil with good. And we do it just one person at a time. In Acts chapter 8, you read about Paul and Silas going into Philippi. and You, you know the account. and they, Eventually they are beaten before all the, the, the leaders there, the magistrates. They have the stripes laid upon them. They're put in the stocks. They're put in the prison. And at midnight, they're praying and singing. And then there's that earthquake. And all the gates are open. All the bands are loose. The jailer had been sleeping and he woke up and he sees this 
and he assumes that prisoners have escaped, and so he's going to take his own life. And Paul and Silas say, stop. We're all here. And he runs in and he asks them, as he falls before them, what must I do to be saved? Paul and Silas teach him and his family the gospel of Christ. And that same hour, they are all baptized into Christ for the remission of their sins. I know the Bible doesn't tell us, but I believe there's a strong likelihood that that jailer might have been the very one that laid those stripes upon Paul and Silas. It's part of their job. Later that night, he would be washing those stripes, making a difference, just one person at a time, by overcoming evil with good. That's the way God would have us to do it. I know it's not going to be easy. It may not feel natural. We have our rights, we like to think. But this is the way God would have us to do it. And it's the way that will work. September 6th of 2018, a man by the name of Botham Jean was sitting in his apartment in Dallas, Texas. He lived on the fifth floor. On the sixth floor, there was a police officer that lived there. Her name was Amber Geiger. She made a mistake that night. She entered his apartment, thought it was her own, and when she saw him there, she killed him. She shot him. She was put on trial, and she was convicted, sentenced to 10 years in prison. But the victim's family was there, and at that trial, they were able to speak they were able to give their victim impact statement. And when it came time for Brant Jean to speak, the younger brother of Bo, this is what he said. Now it's kind of broken English. They were from Saint Lucia and they speak French there and so this was his second language. But this is what this 18 year old man had to say at that trial. He said to Mrs. Geiger, if you are truly sorry, I know I can speak for myself, I forgive you. And I know if you go to God and ask Him, He will forgive you. And I don't think anyone can say it. Again, I'm, I'm speaking for myself and not on behalf of my family, but I love you just like I, like anyone else. And I'm not going to say I hope you rot and die just like my brother did, but I personally want the best for you. And I wasn't going to ever say this in front of my family or anyone, but I don't even want you to go to jail. I want the best for you because I know that's exactly what both of them would want you to do. And the best would be give your life to Christ. I'm not going to say anything else. I think that giving your life to Christ would be the best thing that both of them would want you to do. Botham was a member of the church. And this young man, after making this statement, asked the judge if it would be okay if he would give Miss Geiger a hug. It was permitted. And after they embraced, he gave her a Bible. That's incredible. Overcoming evil with good. Can it be done? Absolutely. Is it going to be easy? Uh-uh. No, it's going to take more strength than retaliation ever would. And yet it's the way that we as Christians are to overcome the evil that's in our world. Jesus is the one who shows us how to do that. I mentioned it earlier. How he spoke those words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. 
Jesus went to that cross for you and for me to deliver us from this present evil world. My friend, will you let him deliver you? To have that deliverance, you have to obey his will. Final step is that of baptism into Christ for the remission of your sins. And if you haven't taken that step yet, we want to help you. And if you're one who has obeyed, but you've fallen away and you need to come back, we want to pray with you and for you. I hope you'll think about these things. And if you need to respond today, you'll do that. As together we stand, as we sing.